Okay, well, uh, hello everyone to the uh, Applied Mathematical Education Award of uh, 2021. Very glad to see uh, many of you here who want to see this and many people who want to vote for their best candidate. Uh, today we will have a talk of uh, Tracy, Gerrit and of Nelly, and they will talk about uh, virtual mathematics. This is of course uh, a nice and relevant topic right now because a lot of education is online, but maybe they can give us some insight in how mathematics help or how can mathematics deal with the virtual world. And this is of course also for us when we finish this maybe a very interesting topic. Um, I hope you have all prepared something nice. Um, is there one of you who would like to start perhaps? <laughs> if Gerrit wants to start, then uh, I think yeah. that is perfect. <laughs> yeah, the, the reason for me to start is that my laptop easily boils when I run Teams. So within 15 minutes, my uh, microphone will not work anymore. So that's the reason. <laughs> like that was virtual good. mathematics, but just virtual uh, <laughs> or just <laughs> technical <laughs> problems. <laughs> OK, then I will mute myself. OK, I hope you can see the screen. Um, it's not extremely virtual. Well, a little bit of it is virtual. So I want to talk about um, modeling pendulums with complex numbers. And this is uh, an afterthought, an idea that I had after completing module six. Uh, I hope there are some people around that completed module six, either this year or a couple of years ago. Um, so what I will do, I, I will first pay tribute to my uh, Corona companion. That's the thing that really saved me the last 11 months. Then I will um, explain why I want to do modeling of pendulums again. You've all done it a lot in module six, but I think it's time to do it again. Then I will model a single pendulum, a double pendulum, a complete body. Probably will not have time for remarks. I will bore you with some code and I will end with a nice simulation of the triple pendulum. Um, so first, uh, my acknowledgement to my um, Corona companion, and that's the app called Explain Everything. Luckily, I had it on my iPad already a couple of weeks before the um, Corona uh, pandemic started in the Netherlands. And this is the app that I used a lot. So in, in module four, I had to do online teaching with signals and transforms and time series analysis. I had some slides, not extensive, I had some slides, but this app really saved my day. I was able to make videos and without this app, it would probably have gone horribly wrong. So I really should pay tribute to this app. Uh, that's my acknowledgement. Note about the true content of this topic. Um, so in module six, and I hope there are some module six people around. In module six, the conclusion turn, turns out to be that pendulum models are really complicated. And here I have a pendulum consisting of four pendulums, in fact, so four interconnected pendulums. And if you want to come up with a differential equation of such a pendulum, you normally do Lagrangian equations, you work with energies and stuff. And this is what students are doing. And for this four leg, four pendulum system, this is one of the modules that I copied from this year's report. And let me just blow it up a bit. Well, you can't even read it. So this is the module that they got for the pendulum with four uh, pendulums. Well, I had to read this report. Of course, that was nice to read, but of course, it's a bit frustrating to have such a complicated model buried in an appendix. And then the question is, are they really that complicated? Are the models or these type of bodies really that complicated? And the message of my story of today is that perhaps not. And the way to make the model simple, at least my favorite way of doing it, is to model it with complex numbers. So, if you remember these formulas over here, they were stuffed with cosines and sines with angles. But you also know that if you have cosines and sines, and usually the language cleans up if you switch to complex numbers, right? The right hand side is long, the left hand side is simple. So I hope that with complex numbers, you can model 
pendula, but then the model is hopefully easier. And I, I tried this three weeks ago when I read these reports and I was quite happy with it. So that's why I couldn't resist sharing it. Um, let me first do the single pendulum. And actually I will go through a bit, quite a bit of mathematics. So hopefully you're quite, you're awake and you have some coffee with you. I will go through it in detail. So this is the single pendulum. It can rotate freely around the origin. And here there is no mass. The mass is concentrated at the tip of the pendulum. And instead of modeling this in R2, which we normally do in physics, I, I think of this as the complex plane. So then the tip of the pendulum is, is a complex number. And of course, you all know this complex number equals the length of the pendulum times e to the i phi. Well, if this is the tip of the pendulum, then you, uh, then you can also figure out how it changes with time. And the only thing that changes with time is phi and therefore x. So let's differentiate x with respect to time. That's what x dot means. Well, you can all differentiate exponential functions. So this is x dot. So now we have the speed of the tip of the pendulum. Let's differentiate it once again. Then you get the acceleration of the tip of the pendulum. Well, you all know product rules and chain rules and stuff. So this is the acceleration of the tip of the pendulum. And then, of course, we all remember Newton. Newton says that force equals mass times acceleration. Well, we already have the acceleration here. So I just multiply this thing by m to give me the acceleration of the tip of the pendulum. That's the right hand side over here. And that mass times acceleration, according to Newton, should equal force. Now the force consists of a, a gravity, and the gravity, of course, is here pointing downwards. But, but in the complex plane, that means in the direction of minus i, right? Gravitation goes downwards, minus i. So this term represents the gravitational force, g times mass times minus i. Now this is a bit trickier. That's probably the trickiest bit of today. That's the so-called compression force, and you can already see it in this picture a bit. So here in the middle, I have this pendulum and two persons push on it. And as you push on the pendulum, you perhaps you want to look at my hands now. If you push on the pendulum, the pendulum pushes back, right? And that's known as a compression force. And that also happens here, right? Due to the mass, the mass wants to pull it down, but then the pendulum pushes back and that's the compression force here. Now, lambda is the extent of the compression force. But of course, the direction is e to the i phi. So the force as a, as a factor is lambda times e to the i phi. And that's why I have this compression force to be added to the total force. Well, that was a bit of physics. The good news now is that the pendulum, is, the pendulum model is complete. Um, this is the, still looks rather tricky. If you divide left and right hand side by m, l, i, e to the i phi, then this equation becomes this one. We don't have to go through the math right now, right? And this equation is interesting because, well, let's read what it says here. The real part determines the model. Indeed, if I look at the real part here, this term cancels, right, in real part. So this is zero real part. This has zero real part. Therefore, phi double dot must be the real part of this thing. And that's the standard model for the pendulum. If you do it with real numbers, you have cosines and sines all over the place. This is already quite a bit shorter, I think. Also nice, although not very important for the project, is that the imaginary part actually determines the compression force. So you can determine both the acceleration and the compression force from this one single model. Well, that was the single pendulum. Yeah, I have to admit I'm, I'm throwing lots of formulas at you, but we're mathematicians, so you should love these. Next, I will do the double pendulum. <laughs> um, so now I have the double pendulum. I have an X1 here and I have an X2 here, tip of the two pendulums. What is X1? Well, X1 obviously equals the length L1 times e to the i phi1. Right, L1 is the length of this pendulum. What about X2? Well, X2 is on top of X1. So X2 is actually X1 
plus the second pendulum. So X2 equals one times L1 e to the I phi one plus one times L2 e to the I phi two. And now we do a nice trick. I, I love this part. This red matrix I call E, sort of a structural matrix or a configuration matrix. And L1 and L2 I combine into a column vector L. And these two exponential terms I also denote in this way. And along the way, I've introduced a new vector product because L is a column vector. This E to the I something is also a column vector. So I'm doing here column times column. But I mean by that the element wise product. All right. So Nelly would probably complain in your algebra. Column times column is not possible, but I make it possible by definition. This is the element wise product. And now I'm essentially I'm back uh, at the single pendulum case. The only difference with the single pendulum case is the presence of this structure matrix E. So X is E times something. I can differentiate it. I can differentiate it again. It's the exact same formula as for the single pendulum, except for this matrix E in front of it. I still have Newton. So M times A is still M times this whole thing, this whole thing over here. What about the force? Well, I have two gravitational forces here. Minus I in direction, G times M in magnitude. So this is the gravitational force. And this is a nice one. This is the compression force. Let's look, perhaps I'm going too fast. Let's look at X1. What compression forces are acting or on, acting on X1? Well, we still have good old lambda one e to the i phi one. But we also have this blue bit over here. And this blue bit is exactly minus this red bit. So the total compression force here is lambda one e to the i phi one minus lambda two e to the i phi two. And that's what we can represent over here. One times the first minus one times the second. Right? And the compression force on the top pendulum is just lambda two e to the i phi two. So it's zero times the first one times the second. And now again, I want to clean up the notation a little. By the way, I have 210 slides. <laughs> Uh, this matrix I call S. It also comes from the structure, right? Lambda one and lambda two I combine into a column vector lambda, and this e to the some things I already combined. So then this is my model, and this model is exactly the same as for my single pendulum, except for these matrices S and E. Also here, the system, this equation here, is linear in acceleration and compression force. And you can solve for it uniquely. I don't want to go, go through it, it's just linear algebra. So that's my double pendulum. And now I have, I have really good news. This model over here works for every pendulum. I hope you're now all you're surprised. Right? This model really works for every pendulum. For instance, the body, like this is the leg, the, the main body, and the arms here. You can express the, the, the tip of the four pendulums with a matrix times L times E. This matrix over here is now my matrix E. And then the model is exactly the same as the model I, as I had for the double pendulum. So this one equation, that's my claim, models all possible pendula. And in fact, there's a nice math result, which I don't want to go into here, is that S and E are related. S is E inverse transpose. But that's not a thing, but I hope you're impressed, right? Here I have four pendula. I could as well as have taken 100 pendula. I simply have to dream of then 100 by 100 structure matrix E. Then S is E inverse transpose, and this is the complete model. Well, so that's my summary then. I have one model for all pendulum configurations. If this is the one. And since I probably run out of time, I will stick to the blue bits. Um, it would be nice to look at it next year in module six, hopefully in non-virtual reality, right? Because especially doing projects, it, it really suffers from Corona, right? That's just sort of okay. Projects you want to discuss face-to-face. -face. Next year, hopefully face-to-face, -face, 
we can analyze uh, my, my attempt here. Hopefully some first year students want to, want to do it, would be fun. And since I have one model for all pendulum configurations, I, own, I also have one script to simulate them all. Well, this is the script. You don't want to read it. Boring, boring. The only reason I show it is to impress you about how simple the code is. Here I'm modeling the triple pendulum, n is equal to three. Here I simulated, really not so interesting. Um, and then the, the final 200 slides, I will show you the simulation. And uh, so for each slide to have a separate picture. And I wanted to show you the triple pendulum anyway, but since we are with the three of us, I could not resist adding the three of us. So this is a simulation of the triple pendulum. And um, I hope this sort of worked. In my screen, it looks um, real time, but um, I hope it sort of worked. And I hope you like the fact that the public number is easier. <laughs> we saw it. It worked perfect. <laughs> I was already afraid when I heard uh, 200 slides, Gerrit, but <laughs> when I saw code, I probably uh, imagined it would be this. Really cool presentation, though. On a very creative end. Probably lots of mathematics, but since it's fresh, I mean, I, I dreamt this up three weeks ago while reading the reports. I could not resist telling it, otherwise I would forget about it, probably. I think it is also a pretty cool upgrade to the project. I mean, I already liked the project, but <laughs> the generalization is very clean. Next year, I hope two or three groups will have a look at this model because it's not complete. I mean, I, for instance, when is something invertible, I didn't really figure it out. It would be really nice if two or three groups really go and in, look into this complex, hence easy model. Perfect. I'd be very surprised to see how that works out. But let's also um, uh, give some time to the following speakers. Like yep. one last uh, small round of applause for Gerrit. <laughs> Good job. Uh, maybe Tracy wants to go now? Sure, I'll need to share my screen. Yes, then I will mute myself. Um, can somebody confirm that my screen is visible? Yes. Okay, all right, off we go. I need to keep an eye on the time. I can't see a clock anymore. Okay, all right. So uh, first of all, I want to thank the applied math students who recommended that I be included on this list. I am very surprised since I do not see the applied math students for much actual mathematics. I mostly see you in the non-math portion of your first year um, curriculum. And to even consider myself worthy when on the same list as Gerrit and Nelly is some serious hubris. We were asked to speak for 10 minutes on the topic of virtual mathematics. I have chosen not to talk about mathematics itself, but rather to talk about the teaching of mathematics in a world where educational resources and environments are becoming increasingly digital and virtual. And I'm not talking about the last year with all this horrible Corona stuff. I'm talking about the world in general and how educational opportunities have really ballooned in the last couple of decades in your lifetime. In fact, <clears throat> for many years, oh, there's my little arrow. Move on. There we go. For many years, classrooms have looked something like this. Sure, the screen at the front might be a whiteboard or chalkboard. The benches might look different. Certainly the gender profiles have changed over time. But the teacher as provider of information, of knowledge, and the student as recipient of that knowledge is a model that's as old as centuries. Theories of learning have come and gone. Piaget's theory of constructivism was revolutionary in its time. But since then, uh, theories of social constructivism, communities of practice, and concepts such as disciplinary discourses have shifted the focus from the student to more about the community within which the student is located or is active. Still though, let's say as a teacher, your theory of learning is social constructivism, and you think that students work best when doing group work or doing something involving active learning, where knowledge is developed through your connection with others, 
Still, the onus seems to be on the teacher to create the environment within which teaching and learning can flourish. The teacher supplies the materials and designs the activities. Your classroom might have a flat floor rather than a raked lecture theatre such as this one. Students might be sitting in groups. Yet still I argue that all of these classroom situations that I've described still have one thing in common. Web 2.0 refers to websites that, em that emphasize user-generated content, ease of use and a participatory culture. If you can pull your expectation of how learning happens out of the traditional classroom, and I admit I really struggle to do that even though I'm talking about it, then perhaps the classroom is virtual. And one, teachers and students can swim in this digital sea of effectively endless content, content that's been constantly generated and thrown out into the cloud for everyone's benefit. Here is one way of looking at all of these wonderful resources. Wow, that's an amazing video with fantastic graphics. If I want to be a good teacher, I need to learn how to make those graphics and, you know, multiple pendular. So, and also I could say, I could look at say um, MIT and say, wow, that's, they came up with some really interesting activities and exercises, and they've really explained that complex topic very well. I need to be just as creative and come up with activities like those. And I need, but uh, perhaps, the wonderful applications were ones that I didn't actually know. So if I want to be a good teacher, I need to be reading and studying more widely so that I know those applications and can use them to enrich my classroom. But that way lies paralysis. As a teacher, I, we, will never have the time to learn all of this, to learn the fancy programming skills and spend time reading about all these possible applications and creating wonderful activities and, 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 so we do what we can, and what we can is good, but it never feels good enough. One might even think, why bother? I'll just keep with my same old, same old. It's not bad after all. It's just not as good as three blue, one brown. So here is a different perspective. As a teacher, I could choose my, to see myself not as a creator and presenter of materials and activities, but as a curator of resources. Yes, there are amazing resources out there. I don't need to be able to do what those people have done to be able to make those beautiful videos and program those versatile calculators. I can recognize the value of the resources and make my students aware of their existence. I can use those connections to augment the materials that I am already providing to enrich the classroom environment. Or if I'm very clever, I can design activities where we actively build those resources into our course. Someone made a lovely GeoGebra visualization of partial sums of an infinite series. Lovely, I can set a guided self-study exercise where students play with it. That amazing video visualizing complex functions, I can set watching it for homework and then in class we can have a discussion about it, perhaps a quiz or something. Sounds great, sounds hard. Sounds very different from that earlier slide I showed with the late lecture theatre, doesn't it? Except the teacher is still at the heart of it all. The teacher is still doing all the providing, all the creation of connections, if not materials. I suggest that in this world of effectively limitless opportunities for learning available in the virtual world in which we all increasingly reside, that we can put another spin on this view of curation. I suggest that the role of teacher in Web 2.0 or whatever you want to call this amazingly rich world of resources now available is shared by the, the docent and the students. Yes, the teacher should have significant knowledge and skills, both disciplinary and pedagogical, that the students have not yet developed. But the ability to find a great resource and say, hey, this video explains proof by induction so well, or directional derivatives have never been so clear as in this wonderful rotating 3D graph. That's an ability that's not held by just one person. Everyone in the class can contribute. So I want my classroom, perhaps my classroom of the future, if not now, to be one in which both I and my students are curators of excellent resources. And I've been trying that in my calculus courses this academic year. On my Calculus One Canvas page, I have this diagram of a network of topics that we would be covering. It started with none of those blue dots, just the network of concepts. 
from day one, I encourage my students to send me links to resources that they happen to find that they found useful and would like to share with their fellow students so that their fellow students could also find it useful. And the links came flooding in. Each blue dot here is an image hotspot on which you can click in Canvas and it opens a box with, little, uh, with a list of links that are all related to the topic where it's located. About a, th about a third of the class contributed links. A few students contributed many. A few students never used this network at all, but most students did, some of them a lot. And those who did found it very useful. They found it very helpful. They could find resources very easily that some other student who was struggling with the exact same math that they were struggling with had found and had said, look at this, this really helps. And here is the big deal from my point of view. There were resources submitted by my students that I did not expect. Ones that would not have been present if I had been the sole curator of these resources. For instance, dictionaries and glossaries. On day one, in fact, before the end of lecture one, students had sent me links to glossaries of mathematical terms and of dictionaries with giving ma mathematical terms in different languages. Those were found incredibly useful by the students and it hadn't actually crossed my mind. Resources in multiple different languages were submitted to be put into this network. Dutch was fairly predictable, but there was Romanian, Vietnamese and Chinese, and those would not have been there if it had just been me. There were student created resources. One student made a flowchart of um, how to solve a second order differential equation, asking yourself, is it homogeneous? Is it non homogeneous, etc. And he'd done a kind of a flowchart and he looked at it and thought this is this is rather nice. And he submitted it to me and I checked it for accuracy and I put it on the network and other students used it and really appreciated it. I know because they told me. So to come back to my theme, virtual mathematics, which I or the theme, which I cheekily framed as teaching mathematics in a world where so much excellent educational context content is available virtually. The future I see, which makes best use of this world, this virtual world, is of teacher and student together as curators of resources for a mutually beneficial teaching and learning environment. And there's my talk. Yes, thank you very much, Tracy. Great talk. Also very relevant because also at the UT, I think we had these like uh, team-based learning sessions and stuff. I mean, we are re really working towards that. I found it really enjoyable while it was uh, the case. So thank you very much for your insights. And probably we will see more of that. Um, but due to uh, time, let's uh, also quickly move to the uh, next, uh, to the last talk of uh, Nelly Litvak so that we can still vote after the last talk and decide a winner. But best of luck with uh, your talk also, Nelly. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm trying now to see was I can see more people. Just one sec. OK, great. No. OK. <laughs> so uh, thank you um, very much. And first of all, I would like to thank you all for nominating me. It's a great honor, great pleasure. And I was thinking what I will do, what I will talk about. And um, I decided to share with you my adventures with virtual mathematics, which actually started outside of the university and long before Corona. And in great traditions of virtual world, there will be not many uh, formulas and many cats. All right, so. Um, when I was, oh, sorry, somehow, I, when I was given my uh, linear structures course in the first block, the weather was nice, and the door was open, and um, uh, my cat came in during the class and starts saying meow, and you can see that this is not a cat that can be re easily ignored, so uh, students also heard the meow, and they uh, started asking me to show the cat. So I showed the cat, and everybody was very happy, and uh, maybe this is the reason why I'm nominated for this prize. So I thought, OK, why don't I, I throw some cats in? Uh, but let's start um, with puppies. They're cute too. Um, so believe it or not, but these puppies, these particular puppies came to 
from a virtual mathematics world. And of course, this is not really about the puppies, but this is about this book on the sofa. And uh, this is a book that uh, I have written. It is uh, in my native Russian, uh, language in Russian and it's called Mathematics for Hopeless Mathematicians, Non-Mathematicians. And this book was actually a result of doing this mathematics virtually. And uh, I wrote it with a most unusual co-author. Her name is Ala, and she is actually a hopeless mathematician, non-mathematician. So Ala approached me through social networks and she said, will you teach mathematics to me? That was like in 2017. So she's 47. She learned mathematics at school. She forgot everything. She wants to start from scratch, like from opening brackets, from multiplication, and addition and division. Actually, I met her only after our book was already halfway through. So that was really a virtual project. So together with Ala, we found this Facebook group. And uh, this Facebook group um, now has uh, 28 plus a thousand member members and it's called Mathematics Great and Terrible. And in this group, people who know a lot about mathematics and people who know nothing and every day we discuss mathematics. So that became like one virtual mathematical uh, community. So that was quite some experience for me and very different from what I usually do in the university. So what did I learn from this? I think most surprising insight for me was that actually the process of learning mathematics is the same no matter the subject. So let me explain you a little bit more. So when I do my, my own research, then I learn a lot about mathematics. I read papers, I discuss with colleagues, and that is like endless process of learning. But what I noticed that actually this process is exactly the same for master students, for bachelor students, for our teenage daughter, and for my online community of people who don't know math at all. And I'm sure if puppies were learning mathematics, the process would be exactly the same. So what do I mean uh, by that? What I mean is that, um, and why this process is the same? Because mathematics is not really about complicated formulas. Mathematics is about building a right argument or building a nice argument and being creative about it and seeing connections. And this process of building an argument and seeing connections and being creative really doesn't depend on the topic. On the subject. So on master level, of course, you know my, much more tools and you can think about many more different connections and, and different topics that maybe my teenage daughter does know, but the process of how you do it and how you learn things and how you build the argument, the art of building, building the argument is really doesn't depend on what this argument is about. So I will give you an example what exactly I'm talking about. And for my example, I chose the most basic statement of all, the Pythagoras theorem. So the Pythagoras theorem is extremely, uh, extremely impactful. In fact, the entire space program is built on Pythagoras theorem. But I will not tell about that because this probably will be a, a different topic. You have to nominate me once again to, to hear about it, but no. OK, so uh, now I want to just use this very simple example of Pythagoras theorem to show how this different mathematical argument is built. All right, so here is a book which is called, called Burn Atlas and it, uh, it's offered Jason Wilkes, talks a lot about Pythagoras theorem and he calls it a theorem about the shortest path. So why is that? Well, that is very clear, very easy to imagine. So here is another cat and the cat was sitting near the garden door and the cat thought um, she saw a, a bird. Well, maybe it was a virtual bird, but you never know what it can uh, goes with cat's mind. So the cat rushes through the door and runs to the hanging chair and then rushes to the tree. Then the cat realizes there is no bird and wants to go back to the garden door. So now you know the distances to the chair and to the tree. Then we can use Pythagoras theorem to compute the distance back to the door. And that will be the shortest path, path from the tree to the door. And that is literally what Pythagoras theorem is telling us. However, uh, we can also very easily transported to multidimensional spaces and start talking about things 
for which shortest path is not really completely obviously applicable. For example, shortest path between two words. This is something that I showed in the first week of my linear structure course, as many of you know. So um, how automatic translation works, the words are translated into vectors uh, using machine learning neural networks, and every word is represented as a vector of 1000 coordinates approximately. And then we can actually compute the distance between two words. And if you look at the formula, you see nothing else but again the sums of squares and the square root, and that is exactly again the Pythagoras theorem. Of course, we call it Euclidean distance. Well, that's very unfair because <laughs> this is simply because it's a distance in Euclidean space, but actually it's Pythagoras. OK, great. So I hope I have convinced you that uh, Pythagoras theorem is about shortest path and about maybe distances in multidimensional spaces. Now I want to ask yourself, do you remember proof of Pythagoras theorem? That's not a test, so just give an honest answer to yourself. Do you remember how to prove it? So here is a proof that I like most and I hope it works. Yes, it works. So um, you see you see things moving, right? So uh, you can already see what is happening here. So this red red area doesn't change. And when we move triangles, now it is A square plus B square. And now we move triangles again. And now it is C square. But it's always the same area. So this is how it's proved. And what do we teach you usually in the class? We teach you that you have to learn the proof. Why? Because proof actually tells you what the theorem is about. So if you look at this proof, then you can say, wait a minute, Pythagoras is probably not about the shortest path. Pythagoras is about areas. And indeed, if you ask anybody, like, what is your visual mental picture about Pythagoras theorem, then probably this is what you will see. This large square area is some of these two smaller squares. All right, so then we have a shortest path, we have distance in multidimensional spaces, we have um, we have areas, and I thought that's it. What else can they be? Till I gave a talk about my uh, popularization activities in Eindhoven, and one colleague came to me after the talk, and he said, you know, there is another interpretation. So I will tell you about that. So this is, I drew for you very badly this Pythagoras theorem as you know it, and I now denoted this areas by S. So SC, SA, and SB. So this is a Pythagoras. The C, SC is equal to SA plus SB. Now, this colleague showed me this. We could replace triangles with semicircles. And actually, the statement still will hold. Why is that? Because these semicircles are similar shapes, right? They're similar shapes. And an area of any shape is always proportional to its linear size, right? So if C squared, uh, linear size squared, right? So if C squared is A squared plus B squared, and this area is proportional to C square, and this is proportional to A square, this is proportional to B square. And of course, proportionality const, uh, coefficient is the same because they're similar shapes. Then you get exactly the same statement. So if you look at it, then you can conclude Pythagoras is actually about similar, similar shapes. And if you use triangles as shapes, then you can even prove Pythagoras theorem using this interpretation. So it can be about similar shapes. All right, so I thought this is really nice and I thought this is something that a non-mathematician can understand. So I decided to include it in, in the book and I wrote it up. And I wrote it up and I sent it to Allah and I was very much worried. What will she make out of it? Will she understand and what will she say? And to my, and to my great uh, joy, she actually understood it because once she read it, she has sent me this. And this is a kind of creativity which is which is possible on any level of mathematics once you start looking at problems uh, from different angles. And just think about it as, as bachelor students, as master students, how much do you know to become creative about what you are doing? And I can tell you that instead of looking at standard solution, I would so much like the students to do a little bit more of, of this, throw in some cats into the mathematics that um, you do and be uh, creative about uh, how you do it. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for your attention.
Yes, very much for your talk also, uh, Nelly. I think it will help to be creative in mathematics. I like those uh, mathematics memes also. <laughs> I always put them in the presentations. Uh, but now it is time uh, maybe for us to vote on who actually gave the best talk. Uh, the voting is up to the students themselves. I believe uh, Thomas maybe has a link for us. Could you send it in the chat here? I see he's working very diligently. <laughs> Perfect. OK, then we can now take uh, maybe a minute to uh, vote. While everybody's off voting, can somebody explain how you make the little clapping hands? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, you have like emoticons on the top of the screen somewhere next to the uh, chat icon and stuff like that. Yeah. And you can raise your hands, but you can also do applause, I think. Like, let's see. Oh, there. <laughs> Thank you. I have learned something new today. <laughs> and yeah, they should add like a lot more stuff here. <laughs> oh, yeah, now I'm raising my hand. Not really necessary. Now I also worked with Microsoft Teams for TA stuff and it is a bit um, something to get used to. But then again, if you are, there are like tons of tools for this. Oh yeah, please do not uh, select multiple. <laughs> that would be a bit cheating. Mm. And By the way, the thing I think... Uh, get to actually uh submit your answer yes. so only the first okay is not enough actually submit by the way i also believe that werner has brought uh, uh the prize with him it's in his screen uh, if i'm looking correctly at it <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm going to uh, pick it up later today but this is uh, really where you're all fighting for of course yes. can you Great spotlight time. werner so that we can see too I, I can talk maybe that helps me to uh, to get in front yeah. So it's a, it's a sad day for me, obviously, uh, but uh, <laughs> I enjoyed the presentations very much. So uh, <laughs> look forward to Only seeing Only a bit too time. bad that you uh, were not able to uh, defend your position this time. <laughs> Only choice is to recollect the prize next year. <laughs> right. I think more or less uh, uh, enough time has passed maybe for people to vote because I don't think it's a very complicated affair. Uh, Thomas, are you also able to see the results? Yes. Oh. Did everyone vote who wanted to vote? Mm -hmm. Because then I can raise tell your hand if you <laughs> didn't. <laughs> no, I think it's okay. Yes, okay. So uh, only the students were allowed to vote and I think almost everyone voted because we have 22 answers and there are like 30 people here with lots of uh, stuff as well. So that's really nice. Mm -hmm. And so the winner is <laughs> uh, Tracy. Wow. <laughs> Great place. Thank you very Good much. Job. Good job. And uh, I wouldn't blame my colleagues for feeling dreadfully cheated. Um, but thank you very much. That's very, very kind. Well, yeah, enough people really did uh, want to hear you talk uh, at the very least for this. So uh, I think it's a rightful uh, nomination. But your talk was also very impressive. So I think you also deserve this uh, award. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for. Listening <laughs> to me and everything, yeah. <laughs> and Nelly and Gerrit, Nelly and Gerrit are amongst the first friends that I made he, made here in the Netherlands. So I hope I haven't lost friends now. <laughs> Tracy, I met you virtually before you even arrived, right? This is true. In fact, we met virtually first. You're correct. <laughs> well, this year I cannot give uh, everybody here some uh, cake and something to drink uh, to celebrate. 
but uh, I will present something later to the uh, speakers and you will get one of those nice uh, certificates that we uh, <laughs> like to give uh, as a token of our appreciation. But thank you very much for um, uh, well giving us some of your knowledge and showing off your skills. Maybe it's also a great uh, inspiration for the other people to become uh, great teachers. <laughs> At least maybe for some here. Uh, and then with that, uh, I think I will go collect maybe later this price, uh, right Werner? I mean, I think it takes like 20 minutes to get there. <laughs> so I'll be more or less there at two. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, for everybody, <laughs> if you can uh, hand it over to me, then I will hand it over to Tracy yeah, like that. <laughs> okay. But also for everybody uh, present here, you're also very much welcome to come to the uh, card game that we have uh, this night, uh, Scopone Scientifico, a uh, very traditional Italian card game that uh, Lavinio presented to us. And uh, you don't have to be skilled for that because Thomas and I can also do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm mean... personally looking forward to that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But with that, I think I will conclude this uh, AMAP. Uh, congratulations all for being nominated. And congratulations, especially Tracy, for, uh, for winning this and for your great talk. And I think I will see you all later. I have to go teach now.